so happy to be here again. And now we're going to talk about the application of what we talked about this morning, the balance of the grace and the law of God. The first application is in our own life. I don't know what happens in your heart, but I know that in most people's heart, there is a lot of accusation, a lot of burdens, a lot of worries. And I want to say this. It takes daily um, treatment of our heart in order to be able to take care of these problems in our heart. You need to take care of it every day because uh, I guess most people have burdens and then worries or, or saying, oh, I cannot do well enough, I have difficulties. And a lot of times we might have a lot of accusation given to ourselves or saying you cannot do it. No, you cannot do it. But for myself, when I wake up, the first thing I do, Hallelujah, God is loving me, and God is going to use me. Hallelujah, and God is a wonderful plan. And I think about all the things God has done in my life, and I say, God has done this, God will continue to do it. Yeah. I'm sure you all have positive things that happen in your life. So we keep thinking about those positive things, and think about how God has worked in our life. In your prayer, have you experienced His peace and love and joy? So remember that as an expression of God's love for you. That God is loving you. So when I pray for people to experience the Holy Spirit, I ask them, have you experienced anything? They say, yes, I've experienced peace or comfort or joy. And I said, that is God coming to bless you. So you know God cares about you and He's blessing you right now. So every time when you pray you experience the peace, you can comfort yourself and say, God is blessing me, and I can enjoy God. Oh, I can enjoy Him. And whenever I serve God, I help people. God is very happy. And God remembers everything I do. And God records it in heaven. And God will reward me in this world and also in heaven. So every day I encourage myself like that. We all need encouragement. Is it true? Yes. One time, I went to a church to serve. In three months time, the head pastor said to me, would you like to be the head pastor? I'm very tired. He said to me, would you like to be the head, the senior pastor? I'm very tired. Because every time I finish preaching, my wife would say to me, I don't like your preaching. Your preaching is terrible. And I said, he said, every time I feel so tired and, and I see that, you know, people like your preaching, you, you'll be the senior pastor. But I said, I'm not called to be the senior pastor. I, I was called to the uh, student's ministry at that time. So I refused that. But I saw that the senior pastor was burned out. First from his wife, secondly from he himself. His wife accused him and he kept accusing himself. So he became more and more tired. <laughs> so the first person we want to help is ourselves. And it needs daily work. Now when I wash dishes or when I do cleaning in the house or when I walk and I travel, from time to time or in our prayer, from time to time we thought about burdens. We thought about difficulties, right? Has it happened to you? Yeah. From time to time, difficulties come up in our mind. Now many people will say, we do this. Oh, it's very difficult. Oh, life is difficult. Oh, ministry is difficult. Oh, oh, Jesus come back soon so I can go to heaven and don't have to work. Now many people want Jesus to come back so they can stop working. But for me, I say, Lord Jesus, please give me more time that I can bless more people. Of course, if Jesus comes back now, I'm very, very happy. But I want to be able to bless more people. Now, it has happened to me in the past that I felt tired. At that time, I did not experience the Holy Spirit yet. I feel difficult because the people give me burdens, expectation, and accusation, and co-workers give me accusation, and I felt very burdened. And I, I know that some of us here might be experiencing that too. So we need to comfort our heart. Now when Peter was about to deny Jesus three times, Jesus told him he's going to deny, Peter's going to deny Jesus three times. 
Peter has followed Jesus all three years. And Peter was the one who responded very well to his ministry, right? Yeah. He was very excited about his ministry. But then when Jesus knew that he was going to deny him, did Jesus say, Peter, Peter, you have no use. You are garbage. You're going to deny me tonight. How can you do that? Did Jesus say that? No. Jesus said, Satan wants to sift you, like sifting the wheat. But I have prayed for you that you will not lose your faith. And when you turn back, strengthen your brother. Did Jesus give hope to Peter? Or did he give accusation to him? No. No. If Jesus said to Peter, you have no use. Get away from me. From then on, how would Peter feel? Bad. Bad. But Peter, Jesus was not like that. Jesus always gave hope to people. Now some people say, well, Jesus preached very seriously to the Pharisees. The Bible has very serious accusations that fire, God is like fire. And, you know, that the Bible doesn't have words like that. But we notice that Jesus spoke only to the Pharisees like that because they did not repent. And when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that I want to gather you like a hen, want to gather chicks, but you have killed all those sent to you, but yet I want to gather you, but you are not willing. Has Israel, Israel rejected God many times? Yes. Yeah, Even at that time. Now, why did the Pharisees reject uh, John the Baptist? Because the priests think that, and the Pharisees think that they have control their religion. Judaism is in their hand. So they cannot accept a prophet coming to speak to them. That's why in the Old Testament too, it was the priests that was in control. And then when the, uh, the prophet came to speak, many of them were stoned and killed and rejected by the people. And so John the Baptist was rejected by the people. And Jesus asked, the people asked Jesus, what authority do you come to do the, all these things? And then Jesus said, tell me, John the Baptist, where does this authority came from? And then they discussed. And then they said, if we say his authority came from heaven, then he would, Jesus would say, why didn't you believe it? Follow him. And if we say he did not come from heaven, then the people would stone us because the people all know that he's a prophet of God. <laughs> so they were not willing to accept the authority of John the Baptist or the, uh, the authority of Jesus. But Jesus was still saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I want to gather you, like a hen, want to gather the chicks. Can you see the love of God? Now he did speak to them harshly. So we need to understand the words of accusation, condemnation, and the words of comfort and hope. Can you tell the difference? Yeah. Let me ask you, at your home with your husband and wife, do you give each other words of comfort and hope? and say, ah, oh, you're so nice, I thank you, I like you? Or do you say, you're no good, you make me upset? Do we give out words of comfort, words of hope? Now, people might say, Jesus said to the, uh, the apostles, the disciples, men of little faith, it's like accusation. But then Jesus immediately said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move the mountain. Can you see the, the words of Jesus? He has accusation of pointing out the sin of people. Immediately, he will give them hope. And most of the time, Jesus, when he spoke to the disciples, is always words of hope, words of comfort, and words how you can be used by God. When Peter saw Jesus perform the miracles, he bowed down before him and said, Lord, leave us, because we are sinners. But Jesus did not say, well, I'm, I'm going to leave now. But Jesus said, 
you will be fishers of men. So Jesus always give hope. So this teaching this morning about grace of God and also the law of God. Now, the law had different functions. You can write this down. The law would tell us how to obey God. The law tell us how to obey God. The law would stop us from sinning. The law also accuses us and condemns us. Okay? So you write down these functions of the law. First, it tells us how to obey God. And second, it tells us what not to do. And a third, the law will also point out our sin. And if, when, at the point when we don't repent, he also accuses and condemns. When we understand the words of the law, then we know how to use it. I'm going to now apply it to words you speak to ourselves and to people, and to people in the ministry. It's very important. Now, in the Bible, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, he says that he that prophesied speaks to men to edify, exhort, and comfort. So he says that the prophet, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, 14 verse 3 so he that prophesies speak to man to edify edify means to build up to exhort means to try to encourage them to change to let them know some area they need to change and to comfort to give them hope and then in 2 Timothy 3.16 it says that 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrines, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what it says here, the word of God has this different function. It can comfort, it can build up, it can point out the sins of people. It can reprove. It can instruct people what to do. The point is, how do we use it? We have to be aware of how to use it. Have you noticed how many parents talk to the children? They will talk like this. You're too lazy. You can never be a great person. I don't like you. Go away. Have you heard people talk like that? Yes, sir. Or to the husband and wife. How would they how would that make people feel? Discourage. Yeah. Now this is the harsh words of the law. When we use the law, we need to know there is a gentle way and a harsh way. Let me ask you. Today, did I talk about the destructiveness of sin? Yes, sir. But did I did I talk to you in a harsh way? No. Did I beat you on the head? Did I did I rebuke you heavily? No. 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 I was building you up. Even though I was talking about the destructive of sin, the destructiveness of sin, I was not tearing you down. Now this teaching about the grace and the law of God is also very important in how we talk to us and how we preach and how we talk to the family members. I have counseled many couples. One of the teaching in these few days, if I can do it, is counseling, and also marriage counseling, but it's very difficult uh, to teach in a short time. But I'll just briefly say what happened there. So for many couples, what happened is like this. Men and women have a big difference. Men always care about what to do, uh, a goal, in, a, in the life, what they have to do. Now, for diligent men, there are men who don't have any purpose. But men generally, like in ministry, always want to work hard in the ministry. So many men are workaholics. But God created men so that men can build many construction in this world. Different kind of science project, uh, different kinds of project, most of them were built by men. But God created women very differently. Women cares about feeling. 
women want to be careful, and they also would give care. And uh, when I uh, was in a, you know, I've been ministering in a church, but in one church, every time we finish service, we shake the hand of everyone when they come out. And sometimes the parents bring little boys, and the little boys come out, and then what do they do? They were playing with the toys, and then uh, the, the parents say, shake hand with Pastor Yip, and then they will shake hand and turn into the toys. <laughs> and then the little girls, two or three years old, they come out, Pastor Yip, they're very happy, generally. And you notice girls respond to people more, and uh, one time, I, I saw a young lady, about 20 years old. She came up to me. She said, I'm the daughter of that parents, and you greeted us when I was a little child. And she remembered me <laughs> many years later. Now, so women treasure relationship. Now, the problem is, when a husband doesn't listen, the women get upset. And they also feel responsible. Women have a tendency to be responsible for the family. So the women remember the age of the children, the birthday of the children, uh, do they have food, uh, what are they doing in school. The, usually the mother remember everything. And sometimes some husband don't even remember the name of the child, or what school he's going to, or what he's studying. He might forget. And that's why God created men and women different. But when women do not get the comfort from the family, from the husband, what happens is she would be to have she would have emotions, she would start to accuse, and the man would get angry. So in the counseling I explain to them, okay? The husband uh, generally don't want to talk too much, don't want to respond to feelings that much. And the woman usually, usually when the couple come to me, and I ask, uh, is it, how is your family? How is your marriage? And the men always say, nothing, everything well. <laughs> and then the woman said, no, everything is wrong. <laughs> he doesn't listen to me, he doesn't talk to me, he doesn't care for me, he forget about the children. We have all kinds of problems we want to talk about and no, he doesn't want to talk about. So in this conversation, we see the difference of men and women now. In the, talking about the marriage, I will talk about how to handle that problem. But in the counseling, I encourage them, okay? Now, when you keep saying, he didn't do it, he didn't do it, how would he feel? But instead, I would talk to the man, I would talk like this. I would say, I know it's hard for you to understand her feelings because you're not used to that. Generally, men are not used to talking about feelings. And men are generally not sensitive to feelings. That's why when you talk like this, you feel like it's too hard to understand her, too hard to respond to her, too hard to talk with her. And so I would empathize with the men. And I empathize with the woman. And I say, yes, I understand you. Because you talk and the man doesn't listen, and he will play with his cell phone and watching TV, and he doesn't want to listen to you. Even when he you know, do something with you, he'll be thinking about other things and not talking with you. So you feel not so good. So do you want to build a good relationship, a better relationship? They say yes. And then I will talk about how our words will affect the relationship. If the husband begins to say, I like you. You're so, such a wonderful wife. You know, in my cell phone here, you, have, you can see my picture of my wife here. I, uh, and in, my, in the picture out there, when the uh, Pastor asked me to give a picture. I always give a picture of me and my wife Because I want to tell people that I want to build a good relationship And and so I encourage them. Okay now you care about the relationship But when you talk in a positive way the husband will take it Now when I listen to the husband and respond to the husband and say I know it's hard for you I know it's hard for you to understand your wife I know it's hard for you to communicate and you don't know how to say the right thing. And the man said, you're the first person to understand my feelings. <laughs> because I understand him and I understand the woman. Because I listen to both of them and I talk to them with acceptance. I accept how they are. 
I accept the difficulties. Let me ask you, does God accept you? Yes. yes. When Jesus said to the woman, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. Did Jesus respond to her feelings? Yes. yes. So yes. this is not just a psychological thing. It's in the Bible. That when Jesus said, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I want to gather you. Is that caring about Jerusalem? Does he show his concern and care for Jerusalem? Yes. yes. So we see that God is not a God who tears people down. Now there is a place for pointing out the sin of people. I'm going to talk about that later. But in most instances, we need to build up people's faith and the confidence to let them know they are important. First, we know that we're important. God loves me, so we are important. Even though we are sinners, but we are still important because of God. So I encourage our husband and wife. Now I'm going to have this session. I, I explain to them how to talk positively, how to, uh, uh, let me say how they can communicate. And, but I'll say the result first. The result is like this. I let them communicate. And then very soon, when, when I say something like, well, can you start to listen to each other? And the wife would say, he won't listen. And then I would say, now, this is how I do counseling. I will let them communicate, and I will stop them at certain points, and then ask them what they are saying. So I asked the wife, now you just said he would not listen. How would you think that would make him feel? How would that make him feel? And then she said, I guess it makes him feel discouraged that because I don't believe he will change. So do you think you want to talk like that at home, continue to talk like that? Or can you change? Can you change and say, yes, we can try together. Would it sound better? We can try together. We can work on it together. We can communicate in a gentle way better. Is that better than saying, he won't do it? So I noticed that it's very natural when people communicate, they will always say it in a negative way, accusation way. And so I'm raising your awareness up to realize that it's very easy for people to accuse and we did not realize it hurt people's feelings. Let me ask you, when people accuse you, you're not a good pastor, I don't like to hear your sermons. Does it make you, does it encourage you to, to preach better next time? No. <laughs> no. You feel scared. Next time even when you work on your message, you say, do the people like my message? Are they helped by the message? You will keep thinking about, maybe they don't like it. So it doesn't help people. So right now I'm going to talk about how we can talk to people, applying this principle. And also we can see examples in the Bible, how God talked to his people. First, we need to talk more the words of grace. The words of grace you can write down. What words of grace uh, can we speak? We can give people hope. Hope, that's grace. You know, like, yes, you can be better. You can talk to the children and say, you become a great person. When you follow God, you become a great person. You, you become greater and greater. You can be an evangelist. You can be someone doing something, something great for the society. So that's hope, giving hope to people. Appreciation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your wife. Pastor Emmanuel is outside. Thank his wife for cooking the meal for me. And it's wonderful. It's delicious. It's what I requested because I want to take care of my health and that's why I requested the food and they provided for me. I thank you. I thank him and her. So that's appreciation. Now, let me ask you, how many of your members will come up to you and say, Pastor, I like your message. Your message has encouraged me. I thank you. I'm so happy you are my pastor. How many members talk to you like that? Yeah. A few or many? A few. A few, right? Not too many do it, right? So we can build up a culture of appreciation. Now, when pastors say, they're not obedient, they're not doing so well. 
But let me ask you this question. If not for your people, can you still have your church? No. So can we thank them for working together to make this church work? Uh, work? They have done different things, right? So if they feel encouraged and appreciated, they would have more motivation. Pastors saw what I did. What I did was good to God and God likes it. And we can encourage people by saying, God likes what you did, or what you did. And people will feel encouraged. I talked to my wife for a whole day, you know, even though now, because of the internet problem, I cannot talk with her on the phone much. Generally, I would talk to her whenever I have a chance, but now I'm uploading all the videos. So I still send a message. I love her, I like her, I think about her, I care about her all day long. When I'm in Hong Kong with her, I talk to her like that all day long. Some people may say, would that be too redundant? Would that be too much? Let me ask the wives here, do you like your husband to talk to you like that? Yes. <laughs> would you think it's too much? No. <laughs> and my wife told me, when you praise me, when you appreciate me, it means much more than anyone else. When a husband appreciates a wife, it means much more. One wife told me one time, if my husband would say to me, I really like what you do, and the wife said, I'm willing to do anything for him. And that's what happened to my wife. She's willing to do anything for me. Whenever I go on any trip, she always pack my luggage and everything. She has everything planned for me. She cares about every little thing in my life. When I have any insect bites when I come home, you know, sometimes I got insect spice from Africa. Some of them stay longer in my body. And she would examine my body every day to see the insect bites are still there. <laughs> that she cares about me. And I respond by saying, I'm so blessed to have you. You make my life go higher and higher. Because of you, I can speak to the heart of people more. I can understand the feelings of people more. And you are part of my life and part of my ministry. I'm so happy to have you. Let me ask you, even though our husband and wife might have shortcomings, do they have things that they, can, they contribute to our life, that they make our life better? Yes. Can we emphasize on those things? Instead of emphasizing on what they haven't, haven't done. Now, but some of you may say, well, my husband or wife is not a Christian. Even if I change, he might not change. But at least when we change, there is a tendency for them to change. Right? There is a chance for them to change. Yes, if every day we say nice things to them and to be kind to them, there is a chance they can change. And also we can do this. Whenever we give a gift, now instead of just saying, happy birthday, this is a gift for you. We can say this, I'm so happy to have you. I'm so happy that you're born to this world for me. For me, you're blessing me. Instead of just giving a gift, we can ex and say how good the person is. Or when we do something for the person, like you massage your husband or wife and you say, I want to massage you because you're so wonderful. You're so, such a nice husband and wife. Can you do that? You know, sometimes we miss a bus. My wife and I miss a bus. And then I say, now we have some time for dating while waiting for the next bus. So everything happens to me, I will always turn it to something positive. Yes, sir. Will that make you live happily? Yeah. Yes. We need, because God is a God of hope, right? If you look, read in the Bible, you can see that there are so many Bible verses about the love of God, the hope of God, the help of God, the strength of God, the comfort of God, right? Now the Bible does have law. Now we talk about the law. Just now I talk about the grace, the word of grace, of people, of people, that we can say words of appreciation, we can say words of love. Words of love is another uh, grace. You know, we love the person. You are important. I think about you, I care about you, I remember you. Now all these are words of grace, that are relationship. Many times I come to couples, I ask them, can you say something nice about your husband and wife? 
Many times they just say, well, she cooks well. She helps me a lot of things. Most of them talk about tasks they have done, work they have done. But I think the wife would mostly like to hear, she really cares about me. She remembers me. She says nice things to me. She helps me. She makes me happy. Wouldn't that make the wife happier? Yes. yes. And we remember this too. Like if our pastor says something encouraging to us, we remember and tell the pastor. When you encourage me that time, it lifts my spirit up. Is that good? Yes. When we tell people how they have affected our life, these are words of grace. Isn't it wonderful? Yes. And Jesus said that to us too. He said, even when you give a cup of cold water to a little one, he didn't say this, I will remember, but he said, by no means you lose a reward. So he must remember, right? He remember and he reward. So you won't lose a reward. So we can see that God remembers every little thing we do. And also, what God prepared for those who love Him are things that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and the human heart have not followed. What does that mean? That means God remember how we love Him. And then He remember it and put it in memory, and then with the creativity, He will create things for you that you, your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, and your hearts have not thought about. That He remembers and then he prepare wonderful things out with his creativity. So words of grace are very powerful. Do we tell the people in the church, I'm so help, I'm so thankful for you, and I see the pray, uh, the pray, uh, the worship leader is so wonderful, and the deacons help me, and all the people doing evangelism and welcoming the people and taking care of uh, the set up the church. All these are so important for us and I appreciate that and we work together and God remember what to do and God will bless us together. Is that encouraging? Amen. Can you start to do that today? I have preached in some places and the next day the pastor came back to me. He said, I did what you said at home to my wife and my wife was so happy. Our relationship now is much, much better. <laughs> Okay, now, come to the words of the law. We need to have the words of the law. How can we say the words of the law? The words of the law doesn't have to be accusation. First, it can be exploration. What does it mean, explore? Explore is like this. Do you talk to your husband or wife? Well, we have some problem with the child. What can we do? That's exploring. What can we do? Or when we counsel people who say, well, I see that you have some emotional problem. What can you do? So the person will start to think of how he can change, what he can do. So that's exploring. So now I'm going to ask you, can you think of how you can treat your husband and wife better? And treat your church member better? Can you think of one way? Can you think of one way? Can you, anyone here, can you say one way? You can treat someone better. Can you say anyone? You can okay. say it right from your seat right now. So I'm asking you to explore. I can say that. Give them smile. Give them smile. Give them smile. Okay. Give them smile. That's action. That's good. That's action. That's action of grace. Okay. So we can, you know. If we think more on this line, we can think about what we can say to the people and how we can encourage people. Okay, now, the use of the law. First, we can use exploration, exploring, finding out ways how to work on something. <coughs> like, there is a problem in the home. You can talk with your husband and wife and say, what, how can we solve this problem? What can we do? Okay? The next, how we can have the law is instruction telling what to do but i want to say there are heavy instruction and also there are gentle instruction there are polite instruction for instance please wash the dishes for me i'm very happy when you wash the dishes so that's gentle that's asking someone to do it there's another way why didn't you wash the dishes now this is also instruction right why didn't you do it 
Go quickly and wash the dishes. One time, a husband and a wife came out to share, and the wife shared very fluently. And the husband was very slow to speak. He was thinking what to say. And the wife did this. Speak up! <laughs> How would the husband respond? They didn't know what to do. But if the wife would say, yes, you have something to share. Think about what happened that time. Can you share that? That's much better, right? So there's also instruction telling him what he can do. But speak up. That's also instruction, right? Mm -hmm. So there is instruction with heavy law, with a tone of accusation. And there is also instruction that's very gentle. Like this morning, I talked about how when we love God, when we serve God, God is very happy and God remembers everything we do for Him. God is a wonderful God. He remembers everything we do for Him. So whatever we can do for Him, He's very happy. So are you willing to serve Him more? And you can do it. You can do it. You can start to greet the people. You can care about the people. You can ask them what, I, you can pray for them. And then they say, yes, I have something to pray for. I have something in the family. Please pray for my family. And then you can say, what can I pray for in your family? And then we know that he has some problem in the family. And then we can pray. And then we can say, what can I do to help? Can I do anything to help? Or can we find someone to help? Can I find a pastor to help? That way, we are finding ways to help people. Now, just now I was giving you instruction how to help someone. Did I accuse you in the process? No. We don't have to accuse people. When we accuse people and say, you have to go and do evangelism, but you have been so lazy. You're no good. You have to do it. You have to repent. Does it make people encourage you? No. Not necessarily, right? So we don't, some people think guilt will drive people. Yes, guilt will drive people, but it's not a good motivation. If people say, I have to do evangelism because I have to, if I don't do it, God doesn't like me. That way, it's very difficult. If someone says, I have to love my wife, if I don't love my wife, my, life will, my, my wife will be angry with me. Is that a good motivation? No. No. So, in a relationship, it's better to have love. So the motivation, now for me, to do anything for my wife, let me tell you, what's the motivation? Whenever I told my wife I'm going to do something for her, she would smile like a little kid. She's very happy. And then one time I asked her, a number of times I asked her, do you have time tonight? And then she would say, what do you have in mind? I said, do you like to go for a walk? And she's very happy. And then she would ask me a few times during the day, do you know why I'm very happy today? And then I told her, because I asked you for a walk tonight. And then she said, yes. She's always responding very well to everything I do for her. And it encourages me. And I have the motivation, whatever I can do for her, it will always make her happy. But there, I heard a story like this. There was a husband who gave some flowers to the wife. And the father looked at the, the wife looked at the father and said, "How much did you pay for it? This looks so ugly. Oh, you have a bad taste. That's terrible." Now, would the husband have motivation to buy any flowers for her? Anymore? She'll be he'll be afraid. Next time, if I buy the flowers, she might accuse me again. So we know that accusation is only for people who don't repent. But there is still a way to do it. I'm going to go to that later, okay? So, the use of the law, first is exploration. Asking how it can be done. The second is instruction. And the third is a command. Now, there is gentle command and harsh command. Now, instruction means teaching. Like, for instance, teaching someone, I'm sorry, I, uh, uh, earlier I, I mixed up with the uh, uh, command. Instruction, teaching means like, like this. Oh, if you say uh, positive words to me, it will encourage me. So it will be good that we speak positive words to each other. This is teaching. We need to teach sometimes. Uh, why do you need to tell your husband? When you listen to me, I feel very happy. 
When you say that to him, actually it's a teaching. Telling him that when he listens to you, it makes you very happy. It's telling him a, something that he might not know. Okay, so the teaching. And the third is in, uh, teach, uh, command or instructing. Instructing what to do. Okay? So the second is teaching and the third is instructing what to do. Uh, is, so instructing what to do, you can say, why didn't you wash the dishes? Or we can say, please wash the dishes. I'm very happy that you help. I'm thankful that you help. And when he's doing that, and you say, uh, thank you for doing that. Now, for my wife, when, I, when we wash dishes, sometimes she's very busy in school. She's a teacher. She's working now in Hong Kong. And uh, I said, tonight you have a lot to do. Go, go and do your schoolwork. And then she will say, let me just wash the dishes with you for a little while. It's a time of dating. She will see every action together as a time of dating. Then we can talk to each other. So that's how we look at things. And, and then she will have the motivation to wash dishes with me. I don't have to tell her to do it. She always does it. She does a lot of things for me. And I'm willing to do a lot of things for her. So this, the third part is the instruction. Okay? And the fourth use of the law is accusing. But there is gentle accusing and also harsh accusation. A gentle accusing would be like this. Do you realize that when you always flirt with these girls, it can hurt these people and hurt you? And I'm, I'm letting the person know what he's doing is hurting himself and hurting the girls. Do you know when you're flirting with the girls, it can hurt their hearts and it can hurt, also hurt your relationship with God. Or it can ask him in a question and say, I noticed that you are flirt with the girls. What do you think? How do you think it will affect girls? And how do you think it will affect your relationship with God? If he doesn't listen, then I will say, How would God think about this? Would God be happy with it? Or would God be angry with it? And then if he's still not convinced, I will tell him directly. But I can still tell him gently. When you do this, God is very angry. Because the Bible says, If you cause a little one to stumble, it's better to tie a rock to your neck and throw it into the sea. So if you cause a sister to stumble, it's better to tie you, a rock to your stone and throw you in the sea. So that's very serious. Do you want that to happen to you? So that's accusation. But I would say it in a way to give him hope. And we can repent now. And God is very happy when you repent. And that is, and God is blessed, you know, God will bless you and, and and he will continue to bless your life and use your life, okay? And then the last one, condemnation. Condemnation is when a person refuses to believe, uh, to repent. Then we have to tell the person that if you don't repent, God will follow you. And God can punish you. And you can lose your reward, and you can even lose your salvation. Now, but... Now, the way I said it just now is very gentle. Actually, let me ask you this question. Do we have to speak loudly for people to hear us? No. Now, some people think they have to speak loudly. God will punish you. They think that when they speak loudly, then it gets into the heart core. But when we can respect the person, you know, you're a very precious person. You're very important. But if you continue to sin like that, you can face the judgment of God. Are you afraid of that? That can touch people's heart too. So when we realize this at home, do we want to use a lot of accusation? No. No. But many people use accusation at home. They might say, the other person is accusing me, so I accuse him. But even if he accuses you, we don't have to take it. We don't have to take it personally. I can respond in a gentle way. We don't have to eat the garbage from other people. When people speak negative, negatively, that's like garbage. We don't have to eat it. We don't have to take it. Even when they speak properly to us, we can say, I hear that you have a concern, and I will listen to you, I will work on it. Thank you for reminding me. We can say it in a gentle way. But people might say, well, if you talk like that, people won't listen to you. 
People will abuse you. Let me ask you, when I speak to you today, does it make you to think, rethink about your conversation with people? Yes. Do I have to yell at you to change you? No. no. Because you are honorable Christians. You are honorable children of God. When you hear the word of God, you'll respond. So I respect that. I don't have to yell at you. Now, there is a place for yelling, but I'm saying most of the time we don't have to yell. We can respect people, and we can say these words of grace, and speak the words of Lord gentle. So today, when you go home, instead of yelling at your husband to clear the garbage, you can say, I'm very thankful when you do this. And then when they do, do it, they say, thank you very much, you're very nice to me. So can you start to say something nice to your spouse and your children today? Yes. And you can say to your children, you're precious. You know, God loves you and I love you. You can become the glory of the family. You will bless this family. You, you can become a great person when you follow God. Do you want to be honored by God and blessed by God and bless the whole family? You can be our honor, our glory. So if you speak like that, and then say, if you study, if you obey the Word of God and obey what we say to you, then you become a great person. That way, if He hears that from you all the time, then He will change. And then when He has done something wrong, we can say, how do you think this makes God feel? And how you can change. How you can uh, repent and change your way of life. Okay? Now, so... I'm applying it, what we talked about this morning, to how we talk to ourselves. Now sometimes we talk to ourselves very harshly. We say, you, you, you were wrong again. You did it, you know, terrible, terribly this morning. You did something wrong again. And you fail again. Sometimes we speak to ourselves like this. But we can say, you did try. Even though you failed this time, it's okay. You can do better next time. You have tried. You did really try. So we can talk to ourselves like that. And God is happy with you. God is happy with your change. You're trying and God sees that. Can you start to talk to yourself like that? Yes. And talk to your members in a gentle way, in a loving way, in a lifting way, and talk to your family like that. So your family will become better and better. Hallelujah. Amen. You have any question? Now some people might say, it doesn't work for my family. Okay, yes, go ahead. Yeah, like, were you raising your hand to ask a question? No, okay. I was, okay. Please come forward quickly so people can hear your question. If you have a question, run up to the front and hold the mic and say the question, please. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead, start. You can start speaking. Okay, come, come. What I mean is you can talk while you're coming up, okay? Wait a little. Uh, I want to ask this question because maybe tomorrow we'll be going for another section. Like when you are telling us about prayers, you told us uh, about praising, uh, interactive prayer, and uh, worship prayers. Uh, this is Africa, maybe. You have heard about Africa, or way of life, and the things, the things that happen in Africa. Sometimes you have common uh, spirits, demons. <laughs> That's why you can see some churches, when you go there, you will be surprised. You understand? So like these prayers, I would like you to at least teach us that is method, the times to use them, to apply them so that it will work for us. Because sometimes we are doing those as prayers because we feel that the spirits here are very stubborn. So when we pray, they like to pray. They will not understand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Wait, I, I'm trying to say, see if I understand what you said. You're saying there are demons with people sometimes. So how can we use this kind of prayer in a church like that, right? Are you saying that? Okay, okay, I'll answer the question. Yes, yes. Now, like African demons are stubborn. When I drive on demons from people, first I will help the person to understand God loves him first. And understand God is almighty. God can drive out the demons. Don't worry. And also, our sins can give a foothold to the devil. So repent of our sins and then come to God. So sometimes we we'll start with loving God. God is loving us. Hallelujah. God is blessing us. And I want to put down the burdens and worries. 
And then when a person is open heart and then I say, in Jesus' name, demons come out. I don't have to shout, I don't have to yell. Sometimes even when I was loving God, demons come out. Because in the presence of God, demons have to come out. Yes, sir. So there are different ways to do it. I'm not saying don't do it other ways. But I'm saying it's not all just doing half an hour. Demons come out, come out, come out. All demons come out. It's not just that. Because if the person's heart is not open, demons will not come out. So they need to take care of the problems in the life and the relationship with God. And uh, now, I, I do have prayer to drive out demons, but I believe we don't have to say it all the time. And we don't have to say it for a long time. If the demons don't come out, that means their person's life is not open yet for God. So there's something you need to repent and to build up the relationship with God and come back to God. You have a question, right? Come, come to okay. uh, Just after this one, now uh, we, because of some of you, you need to have this. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, I heard something about the inflation. You said something to somebody to motivate the person to become very positive and responding to you. I agree with that. Now, assuming you meet somebody who does not respond to such positive motivations, you might say, oh, you're looking so great, you're looking so beautiful. And the person turns around, I wouldn't know the reason I say, you look like... I mean, she will just do one word to bring you down. Then how much encourage are you going to be to continue to give more words of motivation? Let me ask you, are you, are you talking about motivating of officials in the church or your husband or your wife? It's, it's in a family setting. Like somebody is general. General? Yes. Okay. I want to say this. Thank you. Appreciation has to be to the point. Appreciation is not just about how you look. It's observing the person and seeing the person has this quality and has done something good. And then we observe that and then we say, I really like what you did. What you've done is good. Whatever the little thing they have done, we can appreciate and this will encourage people. We don't just encourage people, you're good looking. But the person is not good looking and <laughs> it, it, it can be teasing the person. So to the point, and I think most people would accept it. And uh, now building the relationship and helping person has many aspects. We have to find out about the person. How is the person's life? Does he have a lot of worry, a lot of frustration, anger? We need to help this person but not commanding them to change. To let them to know how this person is, how it's affected by different problems, and then we, we guide them to change and then appreciate them to change. And then when they change a little bit, we thank them, we appreciate them. That way, people respond to change. Now, some people, it takes longer time. It takes longer time to, like you said, some people are not motivated to change. Um, I have helped some people who have serious emotional problems and who don't have motivation to come to church. But some of these people keep coming to me and say, I have depression again. Okay, then I say, come to church and we can pray for you. And then they came. And then they will help. And then they didn't come back. And then I said, you need to come back in order to keep the relationship so you can follow God totally. If you just get help in one time's prayer, you won't you don't continue to follow God, the help will not be continuous. So I, I keep doing that. And some people did change, some people don't change. And so we have to observe, and then we put more effort into people who are willing to change. There are some people who are not willing to change. So they are like the hard rock. There are some people who are more motivated to change. They are the good soil, and we want to put more effort into, into them, but we still want to help the people who are like hard rock.